Well, good morning, church. I want to welcome you guys right here to Stafford campus. Those of you who are watching from somewhere around the world, and then also, of course, our Fredericksburg campus is watching live this service as well. I'm so honored to get to bring to you the next part in our series called Drop the Mic. Now, just for a moment, though, before we get into that, I want to give you a quick update on what's happening at the Fredericksburg campus. You know, we moved into that space back in March of this year with about 80 people coming out of the clubhouse. And I also just want to take a moment, too, and thank everyone who gave to the For the One campaign. We started this campaign last year um, to build money um, so that we could also be able to build this building and begin to reach the community. So thank you to everyone who's given toward that, but also thank you to everyone who's been praying for us. As I was saying, we moved into that building about 80 people, and so far this year, we've been averaging, even though it's just been a couple of months, we've been averaging right around 230 people coming to the Fredericksburg campus. Now, now the best part is, is that so far at the Fredericksburg campus, we've seen 17 decisions for Christ, and five people already take the step of getting baptized right out of that space. So... And we're just so grateful for what God has been doing in us and through us through that, through that space. And hey, if you're watching online from somewhere in the Fredericksburg area, Sunday morning, 9.30 a.m., right on Courthouse Road, that is the place to be is at the Mount. And we would love to have you come out to check out the Fredericksburg campus. As I was saying, we're continuing this series called Drop the Mic. Church, wisdom is more than knowledge. Wisdom is not just what you know, but it's how you're going to live. We've been looking at these one-verse sermons, these drop-the-mic moments from King Solomon. And he's been teaching us through Proverbs that Proverbs really does call, call us to obedience even beyond the ordinary. And life really isn't just about some form of moralism, but Proverbs teaches us that it's about real faith, authentic faith, even if it means that faith is countercultural. Now, today's message is called The Last Word on Purity. And before we get into it, I have a couple of disclaimers that I need to give you as we start today's message. The first disclaimer is this. Today's message, if you could rate a message, is probably rated PG, okay? Um, which pretty much means because of where we're going to be in the book of Proverbs, looking at this topic of purity and looking at the virtues that God wants to have for us, if you have young kids in the room, this might actually be a great day, whether you're over at Fredericksburg or here at Stafford, to take them to our incredible kids programming, okay? Um, our kids programming has age-graded worship, age-graded teachings that help Jesus see, help the kids see who Jesus is. Plus, all of our, our, our family ministry workers have been background checked, so it is a safe environment for your kids. So if you want to take them to that, that, that um, kids' environment, our ushers or our greeters at either campus can help you find that, help you get them checked in if you haven't been yet, and especially if you don't want to necessarily have any other conversations today um, that maybe you're not ready to have yet with your young kids. So the second disclaimer is this. If you're not dead, God's not done. I want you to know I want you to know that if you're breathing today, that God's grace and his forgiveness, his healing, his hope is still available to you. In fact, it's available right here, right now. And sometimes when we talk about this subject of moving away from purity or the virtues that God has for you, sometimes people think, well, all I'll ever be is what I've done or all I'll ever be is what's been done to me. But the truth of the matter is, that could not be further from the truth. With Jesus, things can still be made new. Things can still be made right when it comes to knowing God. He can still turn something into be to what's better. In fact, if you know him, you can still move forward. So if you're breathing, if you're alive, God is not done with you yet. And then the third disclaimer is that if you have any problems with anything I say today or this passage we're going to go through, just remember this, okay? My name is Andy Lavallee. <laughs> it's L-A-V-A-L-L-E-Y. If you have any problems, send any emails to this uh, Andy, which is me, Andy Lavallee. Any phone calls, just send it right to him, okay? I mean me, of course. So, uh. 
All right, if you have your Bible or a Bible app, go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 20. And here in Proverbs chapter 6, Solomon, again, this wise king, he's actually speaking to one of his children, one of his sons, and he wants to give them some wisdom on this topic of purity. He wants to give them some wisdom. And we're going to read starting in verse 20 through verse 27. And verse 27 is our drop the mic verse for this week. So listen to what Solomon starts off by telling his son here in Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20. He says, My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them always on your heart, fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. For this command is a lamp, this teaching is a light, and correction and instruction are the way to life. They are the way to life that keep you from your neighbor's wife, from the smooth talk of a wayward woman. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. For a prostitute can be had for a loaf of bread, but another man's wife preys on your very life. And here's our drop the mic verse for today. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? You know, Solomon gives his son some facts, but then he also gives his son a warning. So today I kind of want to do the same thing. I want to give you some facts, but then I don't necessarily want to give you a warning, but I want to leave you with a question, a question that I think all of us need to ask And to keep on asking when it comes to this subject subject of purity and what it is that God wants for us. You know, here in Proverbs chapter 6, starting in verse 20, Solomon tells this, this young man to not forget the teachings of wisdom. He says, look, you need to bind these things around your heart, tie them around your neck. These things are going to instruct you and guide you. They're a lamp. They're a light for you. And he wants to remind him of these things because he wants him to know that, look, temptation is going to come. Sin is going to try to rear its ugly head. And he wants to remind his son that, look, I'm not just teaching you some sort of old family sayings or some sort of old family traditions. What he wants to remind his son of is that he's teaching him these wisdom and these values that come from God. And he wants his son to know that no matter what it is he's going through in life, no matter what it is he might be struggling with, it is God's principles that will stand the test of time. And he wants to know that these principles are wise. And he starts off by wanting to remind his son of who God is and what it is that God wants to do in his life. So I, I thought I would start off today by just sim- giving, simply giving you some facts about God. So here's some facts about God. The first one is this, is that he created you. God created you. He is the one that made you. You are not a mistake. You are not an accident. In fact, sometimes there may even be accidental parents, but there are never accidental children. God made you and he brought you into this world so you could experience life, but so that you could experience life through him. But ever since the beginning, ever since sin entered into the world, sin has been trying to break what God created. It has been trying to corrupt who we are, our identity, and what it is that God has made. But the closer you are, the more you look to your creator, the more you begin to see who you really are. The more you begin to see what it is that he really wants for you the more you really begin to see you. It's the same thing the Apostle Paul was trying to teach the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter chapter 2, where he says, for we are God's masterpiece. Not a mess up, not a mistake, but a masterpiece. And he has created us anew in Christ Jesus, which that is our identity. That's where our identity is found, anew in Christ Jesus. When we know the one who made us, which is Jesus, he says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. I see the more the creation, which is us, knows the creator, which is God, the more we see who, we're, who we were really created to be. So God is the one who made you. He 
created you. And no matter how much sin tries to break that, no matter how much culture tries to break that, the more we look to him, the more we see who we were really created to be. But not only did he create you, but he also cares for you. Church, God cares for you. You know, I, I want you to know, and maybe this is from my own therapy, I want you to know that I really do care for my children. I really do love my kids, and I really do care for my kids. Even when they annoy me, I care for them. Even when they try to steal my dessert, okay, <laughs> I care for them. Even when they disrespect my wife, I care for them. Even when we have to give them discipline, I care for them. You know, there's something that we say around our house all the time. Oftentimes, especially when we're trying to get our kids to understand something, or we're maybe even trying to correct some behavior, even when we have to discipline them, we say to our kids all the time, and we say to them, look, we're, we're not trying to hurt you. Because sometimes uh, it's almost like they're taking what we're doing to them as a personal attack. But we try to tell them, look, we're not trying to hurt you. We're only trying to help you. And so we, we try to teach them that when they're outside and they see some random bug that they want to pick up and eat and we take it away and they cry, we're not trying to hurt them. We're only trying to help them. When they're running around the house with a pair of scissors in their hand, in their hand that they found, okay, and we take it away from them, we try to let them know, look, we're not trying to hurt you. We're not trying to ruin your fun. We're only trying to help you. In fact, even yesterday afternoon, I was vacuuming in our house. And yes, real men do vacuum, okay? <laughs> That's right. I was vacuuming in our house, and um, you know, we have a corded vacuum, and I was vacuuming around the house. And our youngest, who's one year old, um, she's sitting, and she loves to chase things now, crawl after them. And, and she, um, she takes the cord, and she puts it over her shoulders. Okay, she hasn't wrapped it around her neck. But she puts it over her shoulders. So my wife goes up to her and just takes the cord off of her neck. So again, she doesn't get entangled up in it or wrap it around her neck and something worse happens. My wife just simply takes the cord off of her neck. And then our one-year-old looks up at her, sticks out her lip as far as it can go, and just starts bawling her head off like we had just punched her in the face. <laughs> and even her, we looked at her and say, look, look, Harris, we're not trying to hurt you. We're only trying to help you. And church, I want you to know that when God gives his principles, when he gives us wisdom for life to live by, God is not trying to hurt us. He is only trying to help us. In fact, there's no one in this universe that cares more about you than he does. There's no one in this world that wants more for you than God does. In fact, even though, and this is good news, this is good news, the fact that even if you run away from him, he still cares for you. Even if you ignore him, he still loves you. Even when you disobey him, God still cares. In fact, it's the same thing the Apostle Paul would try to remind this church in Ephesians again, in Ephesians chapter 3, where he says, And I pray, and I pray that being rooted and established in this love, that you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to even begin to grasp, to even begin to understand just how good, just how great and unconditional the love of God is. The love of God that sent Jesus to die on the cross for us, the love of God that still gives us chance after chance after chance after chance after chance. That you would even begin to grasp how wide and how long and how deep and how high is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Church, God cares for you so much. He created you. Oh, how much he loves you. But oh, how much he cares for you. But God's also called you. And when we're talking about God calling, we're not necessarily talking about a location or a vocation. 
But what I'm talking about is God calls you and he's more concerned with the type of person that you're becoming rather than your location or even your vocation. In fact, one of the things I love that Pastor Todd has been teaching us over the past uh, maybe year or two, he's been saying this phrase over and over and over again. He says, when you know who you are, you'll know what to do. And when you know that God is the one who made you, just how much he loves you and he cares for you, you begin to see that what he's called you to is so much more than you could hope or imagine. And that's why Solomon wants to remind his son that these promises and these principles, don't forsake them. Don't move away from them. Store them in your heart and do whatever it takes to remember and to hold on to them. Because it's through him, through God, that we really see our identity. And who God is calling us to is so much high, such a higher standard than anything culture could ever offer us. Who God is calling you to be is better than anything that sin could ever offer. In fact, it's the same thing that the Apostle Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 1 in verse 13, where he says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his, as, at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, here it comes. This is what God is calling us to. Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I'm holy. What God is calling us to is a higher standard. It's a better standard. And if you think about it, in all areas of our life, we want a higher standard or a better standard. I mean, we want a better standard when it comes to the house that we're living in. We want a higher standard in our bank accounts. We want a better standard when it comes to our relationships or our education or education for our children. We want a better life for them than even what we had when we were growing up. In all areas of our life, we want a higher standard, standard or a better standard. But sometimes when it comes to the subject of purity and the virtues that God wants for us, we oftentimes want to create our own standard. So God created you, he calls you, he cares for you. But here's where the tension comes in in this passage. In verse 25, Solomon writes, Look, do not lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. And see, it was common practice during this time period that people will oftentimes go after their own sexual desires that were outside of the principles and boundaries that God wanted for them. In fact, oftentimes, especially if they were wealthy um, or they were in some form of power, it wasn't uncommon, them, uncommon for them to go after other people's spouses or even go after prostitutes or concubines. And Solomon wanted to remind his son, at least at this point in his life, he wanted to remind his son of these godly principles. But I think Solomon also wanted to give his son some facts about not only God, but also give some facts about us. So here are some facts about us. The first one is, everyone is tempted. Everyone is tempted in some form or some fashion by different things. In fact, I want to know at, at both campuses, if you've ever been tempted to do something that you weren't supposed to do, if you've ever been tempted to do something that you knew was wrong, no matter what it is, if you've ever been tempted, raise your hand up. Raise your hand up at both campuses, Fredericksburg, raise your hand up. Now, if you don't have, have your hand up, you're just tempted to lie, and you just follow <laughs> through with it because everybody is tempted in some form or another. And look, Solomon's reminding his son, look, you may, not, you may be good right now, but temptation is going to come because everyone is tempted. But another fact about us is not only is everyone tempted, but every sin begins with a thought. Every sin begins with one single thought. In fact, Solomon said, look, do not lust in your heart. And he's reminding his son that oftentimes before someone goes out and tries to steal another person's spouse or engage in sexual relations or orientations outside of God's design, it begins with a thought, a thought that can captivate you. And grow into something more. Things never just happen. It begins with a thought. 
In fact, a good definition of lust, according to Dr. David Jeremiah, is an intense or unrestrained sexual craving or a preoccupation with the object of one's desire. It begins with a thought that preoccupies our mind. And it's something where instead of letting God's wisdom lead us, we let our sin lead us instead. But not only is everyone tempted, not only does every sin begin with a thought, the next two kind of go together where everyone thinks it can never be them and everyone also thinks that it will only affect them. Sometimes when you hear stories about how people have moved away from the purity that God wants for them and the damage that's caused, sometimes we think, well, that would never be me. I would never be tempted that way. Even though everyone is tempted, I would never be tempted in that way. It would never be me. And sometimes when we're engaged in sin... We think, well, it's only going to affect me. And if it's making me happy, then what does it matter what, any, what anybody else thinks? Because it's only affecting me. But the truth is, church, sin will take you further than you want it to go. It'll keep you longer than you want it to stay. And it'll cost you so much more than you ever wanted to pay. And if you're engaged in sin, it's not just affecting you, but it's setting things on fire around you. And it's not just you who will get burned. It's the same thing the Apostle Paul would try to teach another church in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where he says, These things happen to them as an example, and they were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think that you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. He says, no temptation is overtaking you except what is common to mankind because everyone is tempted. Every sin begins with a thought. Everyone thinks it's not going to be them, but everyone thinks that when they're, going, when they're in the sin that it won't affect anyone else. But no temptation is overtaking you except what is common to mankind. But God is faithful He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure. So then here comes Solomon's warning to his son. And this is our drop the mic verse for today. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 27, he says, Can a man or a woman, can a man or a woman scoop fire into their lap without their clothes being burned? Can you, can you see the, the word imagery that Solomon's trying to paint for us here? It's almost if you were, you know, you had your charcoal grill and you're getting ready to grill some hamburgers or some hot dogs and, and the coals are in there and those coals are red hot. I mean, they are ready to go to cook the meat that you're about to put on top of this grill. But then somebody comes over, takes that stuff off, takes the lid of the grill off and they start reaching in there with their bare hands and starts trying to scoop out the hot coals and starts either trying to embrace them or starts trying to put them in their lap and get comfortable with them. And if you saw somebody doing that, you would think that person was insane. But Solomon's trying to tell us, look, there's so, sometimes we can think that we can play around with this type of fire. But if you think for a second that you won't get burned and other people won't get burned, then you're missing what God wants to do in your life. You know, on the 4th of July, we gave our kids some sparklers. And as I mentioned, they're, they're all young. They're 8, 6, 4, and 1. Uh, so we gave all of our kids some sparklers, except the one-year-old, because you don't give baby sparklers, okay? Just wanted to make sure I give you another disclaimer. Um, so we didn't give her a sparkler, our one-year-old, but the older ones, we did give a sparkler. And I, I gave them some training on how to use a sparkler. I told them, look, you need to make sure you hold it away from your body, hold it out like this, and, you know, you can wave it around and try to write your name or draw shapes like this, but you need to make sure you don't point it at your face, okay? You need to make sure you don't try to touch your brother or your sister with it. You got to make sure that you don't try to eat it, okay, the things you have to tell young children, Don't try to eat it. Don't try to put it on somebody else. Just hold it out like this and wave it around and everything will be good. But it is fire and if it touches you, it will burn you. 
And our, our second oldest, his name is Noah, and he had it where he was doing good at first, holding it around, waving it around. And then, you know, he started to let his hand kind of fall and just he was kind of holding it around like this on the ground. And, and of course, it's summer, so he's wearing shorts and flip-flops and he's just holding it like this and swirling it around. And wouldn't you know that one single spark fell off of that sparkler onto his foot. And you would have thought somebody would have put a blowtorch on that kid's foot. I mean, he started screaming. He threw his sparkler down. He was done with sparklers for the rest of the night, went and sat on a chair, watched everyone else do their thing, and didn't want to have anything else to do with it. And my wife said to me, she said, isn't it funny? Isn't it crazy how one spark can cause so much pain? I think what Solomon is trying to show us right here is that when you move away from the purity and the virtues that God wants for you, this is no small spark. But it's going to cause a lot of pain. You know, lustful thinking and sinful sexual activity comes with a very, very high price tag. It really is like trying to scoop burning coals or hot flames into your lap and thinking this won't hurt me and that it's not going to hurt anyone else. You know, fire can either purify or it can annihilate. And in the right context, fire can provide warmth, it can provide light, it can even provide life. But fire uncontrolled and in the wrong place is devastating. You know, in our, in our casual sex and hookup culture where pornography and hookup apps like Grindr and Tinder and even Snapchat have come in, they're actually pouring more fuel on the fire. You know, we want things right now. And it presents this idea that sex and people are just a commodity. It's just something to do. It's on demand. You can binge watch it. It is an Amazon Prime relationship. In fact, who cares about the consequences? Who cares that I might get burned? But see, when sex moves out of God's design, what it is that he wants for you, what it is that he wants you to wait for and enjoy, what it is that he created, it will end up burning you and end up burning others. So here's my question for you. Here's my question for you. Is what you want right now really what you want the most? Is that relationship that you're going toward, is even that app on your phone, is moving away from the purity and the virtues and what God is calling you to, is what you're going after right now really what it is that you want the most? See, when it comes to swiping right or sending pictures of yourself or messaging that old fling on Facebook from college or setting up meetings in the office and flirting with that person that is not your spouse or even just treating people as a commodity, is that what you really, really want the most? Is that what you want your life to be defined by? You know, in preparing for this message, I, I really thought I, I, I would probably move away from this topic of sexual purity. Um, but after looking at the passage and, and seeing in Proverbs chapter 6 in context just how much Solomon focuses on this. In fact, I would even challenge you to go back and read all of Proverbs chapter 6 and all of Proverbs chapter 7. Because Solomon leans into this even more to show how important it is. Then I started to think about how Pastor Todd set it up that this weekend he would be out of town and I would have this particular <laughs> passage to look over. So thank you, Pastor, as well. Um, but I, I want you to know, okay, I, I was thinking about how even though it happened on this weekend, that Pastor Todd really did set up this message weeks ago, months ago. And I believe that maybe somehow God was working in all of this and this particular passage of Scripture because there are probably sitting in, people sitting in one of these rooms today sitting over at Fredericksburg or even watching online where you've, you've come out victorious in this. Right now, and knowing what God's calling you to and the purity, purity that he wants you to have in your life, man, you are in victory. And maybe you just need a reminder that, hey, look, you're not alone, even if you're facing temptation again, that God still cares for you and victory can be had when you keep letting him lead you instead of these temptations. But I also began to think that maybe there's people right now who maybe they're getting close to the flame. 
Maybe there's people even right now, they began to scoop it up. Maybe there's people right now who you've already, man, that fire has already burnt to you. Is what you want now really what you want the most? I also wanted to give you just one more set of facts. Because I believe that God wants us to fight the fire. So here's some facts on how to fight the fire. The first one is this, is that sometimes when it comes to fighting fire, you just have to put it in the right place. You just have to put it in the right place. And see, we have to remember that when it comes to passion and purity, God's guidelines are so good. You know, for some of you, that means that right now you need to redirect that passion and that fire right back into your marriage. And even though you think things are broken and what's on the other side might be looking better, you need to redirect it back into your marriage. And it will not be easy, but it will be so worth it. And for some people right now, maybe you're single and you've been putting that fire in the wrong relationship. You've been putting that fire even in the wrong apps on your phone, even in the people that you're hanging out with. For some people, the best thing that you can do is redirect that fire back into a right relationship with God and put in the focus back on him and what it is that he's calling you to. There's no one who wants better for you than God does. So redirect that fire, that purity back into a right relationship with him. Another way that you fight the fire is by simply calling for help. You know, if your house was on fire right now, one of the first things that you would probably do is pick up 911 and say, help, I need somebody to come over and help me. And sometimes when a fire is happening in your life, you just simply need to call for help and get somebody to help you. So what is that for you? Is there counseling that you need right now in this season? Is it simply that you need to find accountability through someone that you trust or even somebody in a life group? Or maybe it's simply that you just need to begin to confess some things to God and confess some things to the people in your life so God can begin to do his healing work in you. You know, I love that this church also gives out resources to help people. One of the most valuable resources we have is called Celebrate Recovery. In fact, it meets on Thursdays, 7 p.m. right here at the Stafford campus. And Celebrate Recovery helps people overcome the shame and the guilt and even the addiction that comes with moving away from the purity and the virtues that God wants for us in this area of our life. And then maybe you say, you know what, I don't want to help in any of those areas. Uh, Let me at least give you some books to be able to read, okay? And one of the first books I would recommend is something called Every Man's Battle. Now, this book is primarily for men. But I'll also encourage a woman to read it as well because it'll help you understand how God wired men, but how sin is trying to break that in them. It'll help you understand what battle is that men face. And maybe men for you, again, maybe you're victorious in this area right now of your life. Maybe you are celebrating victory. Maybe, you know, you're, you're living in the purity that God wants for you. This book is good because it'll be a reminder that everyone still is tempted and every sin begins with a thought. And this will help you stay on the victory side. But for the men right now who maybe you're trying to burn things down in your life, you scoop the fire into your lap, you need to download this book today and begin to read it. The next one is a book called Swipe Right. Uh, This was written by a pastor named Levi Lusco. And this book is primarily geared for those people who are single right now. And again, maybe you've been putting your fire in the wrong place. And maybe you're simply tired of getting burned. This book is for you. This book will help you honor God and live in purity in the 21st century when we are more tempted than we ever have been. And in fact, if you're a parent of a teenager, I would also recommend that you get this book because it will help you understand what it means to, um, to, to, to battle temptation in 2019. And then this last book is for those of you who maybe you've, you're in the fire or maybe you've stepped on the other side. But you believe that God's calling you to rebuild your marriage. You believe that he can still make things new. This book will be a good reminder and it will be a good resource that even what was broken, even what Satan tried to destroy, that God can make it brand new again. But the last fact about fighting fire is probably one of the most challenging, but also probably one of the best things that we could do. Sometimes you just simply need to run away. You don't need to stay there. 
try to see what's going to happen. Sometimes the best thing that you can do is to get away as quickly and as soon as possible. In fact, there's some of you today that right now, even on your, your smartphone, that you just simply need to delete some apps before you even step out of one of our buildings today. In fact, no funny video on YouTube is worth you scrolling and watching some things that you know are taking you away from what God is calling you to. No person following, you're following on Instagram or Facebook is worth it for you to continue that. So the best thing you could do is to delete those apps today. For some of you, that may mean that that person that's been taking you away from what God wants in your life, the purity that he wants in your life, that you need to break up with somebody today. That may even mean that for some of you, the job that you're in, if you're treating people like a commodity, if you know that that relationship with the coworker is flirty, it's going beyond a certain point, the best thing that you may be able to do is to run away. It may mean that you have to take a pay cut for a season. It may even mean that you have to relocate. But isn't that better than gaining the whole world and burning down what matters the most. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, in one of the very first sermons that Jesus would preach, he would, he would echo what Solomon tried to teach his son back in Proverbs chapter 6. And Jesus would say this. And I know sometimes, you know, we, we picture Jesus with his long flowing hair and that pie plate behind his head and his gentle person petting lambs. And yes, he is full of grace. Yes, he is full of love. Yes, he does care so much for you, but Jesus is also full of truth. And he knows sometimes that we need to hear the truth so we can be all that God's called us to be. So Jesus says, I tell you that anyone that looks at a woman or man lustfully has already committed adultery with them in his heart. For if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, Jesus isn't saying here that we need to go cut off parts of our body, okay? He's not saying that we need to mutilate ourselves. But what he's saying right now, there is a part of your life that is tempting you, that is leading you away from the purity that God wants for you, sometimes the best thing to do is as quickly as you can, as fast as you can to throw that thing away, to get away from it so you can still walk in all that God has called you to. So do you need to run away? I'm going to ask our worship team are going to make their way back up to the stage at both campuses and as they're making their way back up the stage, I just want to ask you that question one more time. Is what you want now, even though it might look better, even though it might seem so pleasing to the eye, even though it's pulling you away from you know what God has called you to, is what you want now really what you want the most? You know, Jesus, also in Matthew chapter 5, in one of his first recorded sermons, he would, he would begin the first sermon that he ever preached. He would begin by saying this to the people who were listening to him that day. He would say, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And I believe what Jesus was trying to say is that when we make our purity our priority, we'll see the fullness what God wants to do in our lives. Church, you'll see just what he made you to be. You will see what it is he's calling you to, and you will see just how much he cares for you. There's no one in this world who cares more for you than God. He is not trying to hurt you, but he is only trying to help you. And when we make purity our priority, we see the fullness of everything he wants to do in our lives and through our lives. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I just thought that we would just close out this service today. And I just want to take 
just a few minutes and I just wanna pray for you. Father, I just wanna thank you for your word today. God, I wanna thank you that even though everyone is tempted, God, even though sin begins with a single thought, God, even though sometimes we think that could never affect us, God, even though we think it'll only affect us, God, I wanna thank you that you will never let us go. And God, I wanna pray for the person right now who's living in victory in this area. God, I wanna pray for the person who's following your ways and purity is their priority. God, I wanna pray for the person that they would know that yes, temptation is going to come again, but if they keep following your ways, God, your wisdom, the fullness of life is found there in you. God, would you keep protecting them? Would you keep encouraging them? Would you keep leading them and guiding them through your ways, Jesus? God, I also wanna pray for the person who's God, on the edge right now. God, maybe they've even stepped into the fire. God, maybe they've been burned. I wanna pray, God, right now, they will be reminded and they would know that you still care for them. God, I wanna pray that they would know that your forgiveness is available right now. God, that hope in you is available right now. God, that your grace is available right now. God, I wanna pray that they would know that they are not too far gone, that they're still alive. God, you're not done. God, would you help them even in this moment to begin to turn back to you. God, to begin to find healing and hope in you. To put the fire in the right place. God, to call for the help that they need. God, even the courage to run away. God, I believe that you are calling us as a church to a higher standard. God, a better standard. God, to make purity a priority. God, to honor you in everything that we do. God, help us, Lord, to fulfill our calling in you. God, we love you. God, we need you. Lord, we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. On both campuses, let's stand and let's sing.